India is set to take over the presidency of the G20 summit in Bali at the end of the session. The summit, uh, which began today, is taking place in the backdrop of the Russia-Ukraine war, which has brought several economies to the brink of recession. High inflation and impending food security crisis, energy crisis, are just some of the issues that are likely to be talked about at the economic platform, where some of the largest economies and their leaders are meeting. But the G20's reputation has taken a hit in recent times due to an internal strife between the West and Russia. Important day today on day one, uh, Biden and Xi Jinping have met for the first time uh, in person after Joe Biden has taken over as the U.S. president. And of course, in the context of a hardening and increasingly bitter relationship between the U.S. and the and China. A tussle over Taiwan and the trade war still continues. The agenda of the summit has certainly changed and India's presidency may not be easy when it takes over. But what can we really hope to achieve from G20. Why is it important to speak with me on this? I'm joined today by Indranil Pan, Chief Economist at Yes Bank, and Jayant Das Gupta, former ambassador. Welcome to both of you, and thank you so much for speaking with us. Um, Mr. Das Gupta, let me begin with just getting your take on what the highlights will be of G20. Of course, in-person meeting at a very important time, and for India special because we will be taking over the presidency. Do you think that the global south or developing nations will have a bigger voice this time round? Can we hope for that? Yes, I uh, agree that uh, India is uh, going to play a very active role in setting the agenda, which used to come from mainly the developed countries earlier. So the problems, the concerns, and the aspirations of developing countries will figure in a much more prominent manner in during India's presidency. That is uh, uh, for sure. The second uh, issue that you raised uh, is about this uh, food security issue, which uh, is going to get discussed in Bali. Now, uh, this uh, concession which or the agreement which the Russians had uh, with Ukraine to allow grain exports to take place, that expires in another six, seven days. I think 20th of uh, November. So whether that will continue or not, because the Russians also have had a reverse in the, in the last two days, they have had to pull out of Kherson. So uh, we have to see whether they allow this to continue or not. There is also a caveat that the Russians have put in. They are saying that uh, the Russian bank, which finances farm exports from out of Russia, that will have to be relinked to the SWIFT network so that the Russian exports of agricultural products can also take place. So that is uh, a question which the West will have to answer, uh, specifically the European Union and the US. And only then the exports of grain from the Ukraine will resume. I think it's also interesting because you have Russia, China, the US, Europe, all on one platform. And, uh, you know, in the real, even while we talk about the importance of food security, energy security, um, do you hope this could also be a forum to find some solutions to these long-standing issues and at least make this a working relationship? Uh, well, uh, I think there's a very interesting uh, phase so far as India is concerned. Uh, getting into the G20 presidency. And uh, a lot of these issues become relevant for the world economy today. Uh, there are significant uh, sort of uh, uh, tracts of the world uh, which are definitely undergoing a big question so far as food security is concerned. Uh, there has been a significant amount of climate changes which has uh, and will continue to have its forbearance in, uh, on the food security of the world. Uh, so these issues definitely are going to discuss, uh, get discussed at the G20. But I'm not sure whether there are any easy solutions to this, uh, simply because the production of the food green is likely to, as I said, continue to get affected by the changing climate con conditions. And unless we get that in order first, it could have continued to have a severe implication in terms of the world uh, food production as well as productivity. So, you know, just, just on the issue of um, energy security 
and that really is the big one. India in an interesting position over here because India has sort of moved ahead with our take that we will buy from Russia at cheap. We need fuel. We will fuel ourselves. We're not going to join, you know, other countries who may be uh, people we have good relationship with, but we're not going to get into this boycott of Russian crude with them. Do you think that that position now gets verified and underlined today? I think we have to also keep an eye on the changing positions of uh, the West because uh, the UK, from the recent reports, has already gone into recession. And uh, with a looming uh, winter ahead, the energy prices are going to have a, a very uh, great impact on the livelihoods of people on how they uh, face this winter. Because with recession, there would be job cuts, there would be wage cuts, and uh, if on top of that, the energy bill is going to be high, of course, the UK has the new budget is about to be presented in a few days time, but uh, it is likely that they will continue the subsidies till about April. Now, whether they will have the, the money to finance it all the way up to April or not, that is uh, as far as the UK is concerned. In the ca case of the rest of Europe, Again, the energy bills are going to be very high. So this is the time when I think the West also must reassess its uh, situation and its imperatives. Whether they uh, nudge Ukraine to get into a deal with the Russians and uh, resume, uh, you know, the, the lift the embargo on uh, oil imports uh, by certain nations. The UK, for instance, does not import any oil or gas from the Russians, uh, but uh, some of the European nations do. So the reassessment, the introspection, I think is called for, and India can play an important role in this because it is going to take over the G20 presidency after Bali. So uh, in that sense, and India has been, I think, uh, acknowledged to be in a position that it can perhaps act as a mediator between the Russians and the Ukrainians, as well as the rest of Europe and the US. So this is uh, something which we can leverage to uh, bring about a negotiated settlement to this war, which has been going on for too long. Okay, so that's the diplomatic side of it. Uh, on the economic side of it, uh, Indrani, let me come to something that, uh, you know, perhaps you could shed more light on. We've seen global growth forecasts being trimmed by pretty much all agencies. And a lot of that pain is coming from the developed nations, the major G20 nations. Uh, do you think that this is also an important forum to talk about how that looming recession can be pushed back or how, you know, some of its impact can be mitigated? Uh, well, I think uh, the world is, uh, the way the world, I see the world today, it is passing through significant amount of uncertainties. And to a large extent, I think there's a clear understanding that uh, uh, that uh, uh, domestic factors will be taken into bigger consideration uh, as we set around uh, policies. Uh, now, Mr. Das Gupta did point out about the UK, its budget and all those issues. Uh, I would highlight monetary policy as one of the critical factors, and we are still not sure uh, in terms of whether you actually need a hard landing in the US to contain inflation or a soft landing in terms of just a growth recession is enough to contain inflation, and then we are in a safe spot. Uh, the problem is that we really don't know. In terms of the supply shocks, in terms of what uh, Mr. Dashgupta also pointed out, in terms of the energy prices, energy securities, so everything remains an uncertain situation at this point in time, uh, so far as global growth is concerned, and how we look at global growth going ahead. Now, even as we discuss all these short-term factors, I think the other important factor for the globe today is the huge amount of structural changes that are happening, especially with the Western world, uh, whereby you have an aging population. The COVID has possibly pushed a significant amount of population also into retirement, given the asset price uh, bubble, 
uh, quote unquote bubble, uh, if I'm permitted to say post the COVID and the type of monetary accommodation that most of the countries went through. All that has enabled the, uh, the, uh, the workforce being sort of relatively trimmed. And that is affecting the productivity of these nations and therefore a likely slower growth going ahead. Uh, compared to 2008, China is in an extremely soft spot. And I don't think there is any significant turnaround that is visible to me, even though the authorities there are doing uh, everything possible to safeguard their real estate sector and, and sort of trying to uh, provide a flow to the growth uh, in China. Uh, given all that perspective, the, uh, the, uh, the Asian economies or the emerging market economies uh, are definitely not decoupled, uh, given the high level of debt in most of these economies and a rising interest rate uh, doesn't make anything uh, sort of uh, easier uh, for these economies. So I think it's a, it's a huge amount of uncertainty facing us uh, in the global uh, sort of arena so far as growth versus inflation dynamics is concerned. Uh, and uh, I don't think a G20 presidency uh, can possibly sort out all these in, in one uh, magic wand uh, sort of a, a, a way. Absolutely. Uh, you know, uh, the fact that Lavrov uh, is at the G20 summit and the only headlines are whether he was whisked away to the hospital or not uh, is, is what's coming out of it. Instead of uh, world leaders taking this occasion to sit down and try and end the war is very telling. But um, India's sessions tomorrow, Ambassador Das Gupta, what are you looking forward to? Basically, I think uh, the points which Mr. Pan mentioned, there is a huge amount of uncertainty about everything. Whether the war will continue, the energy prices will continue uh, at this level, the food prices, will they uh, uh, you know, not be mitigated? And uh, what happens to the countries which are uh, reeling under a debt? I think um, uh, Janet Yellen, when she was here, last week, he mentioned that this debt restructuring is uh, should be at the top of the agenda for the G20. And the common framework which the G20 had been working at, it couldn't be implemented because of China's uh, reluctance to join it. That, I think, needs to be, uh, uh, you know, put forward and uh, addressed. So these are some of the issues. I think growth will uh, be a much larger issue which will have to be tackled uh, over a period of time, but the important emergent issues need to be taken up first. And if there is a kind of a consensus amongst the major countries of the G20, that would help matters. All right, absolutely. We will wait and see what comes out of the G20 and of course India's presidency coming up next. There will be a handover ceremony where India will then become, uh, you know, the president of the G20 for that year. That'll be interesting and exciting to watch. Thank you so much to both of you for joining us today.